This is Lesson 28 in our Calculus 1 series, the second fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of an integral. I mentioned in Lesson 26 that there are two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus, and it's not universal as to which is part one and which is part two, or which is the first fundamental theorem and which is the second fundamental theorem. So it's possible that your textbook might call this the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, and that's okay, just make sure you know both parts of the fundamental theorem. Before we get into the second fundamental theorem of calculus, let's consider the function g of x defined to be the definite integral from a to x of f of t dt. So for example, here we have g of x is equal to the definite integral from negative 2 to x of f of t dt, where f of t is given here. Now, how do we evaluate g of x? For any x value, we are taking the integral from negative 2 to that x value of f of t. So in terms of areas, that looks like this. This is any x value, and we're taking the integral from negative 2 to x of f of t. So for example, let's find g of negative 2, g of 0, g of 2, and g of 4. Well, g of negative 2 is defined to be the integral from negative 2 to negative 2 of f of t, but notice that the bounds are the same here, so this must equal zero. There's no area. Let's take a look at g of zero. g of zero is the integral from negative two to zero of f of t. So that's this area here from negative two to zero. And we can compute that here by just taking the area of the rectangle plus the area of the triangle. So that's two times one plus one-half times one times one, that's two-and-a-half, or five-halves. That's g of zero. g of two is the integral from negative two to two of f of t. So we're going from negative two to two, so that's all of this area. Now we already computed this area on the left, that was g of zero. So we can add that to the area of this rectangle plus the area of these two triangles. So here's the area of the rectangle, the area of the smaller triangle up on top, and the area of the triangle on the right. And so here we have 13 halves. Now g of 4, g of 4 is the integral from negative 2 to 4 of f of t dt. So we want this area with a positive sign and this area with a negative sign. Now this area up on top, we already computed that, that was g of 2, that we found to be 13 halves. So from that, we want to subtract the area of this triangle. So that's 1 half times base times height, so that's 1 half times 2 times 1, that's a 1, and so we're subtracting here and we get 11 halves, that's g of 4. So from f of t, we're developing a new function, g of t, based on the areas that we compute from a fixed constant. In this case, that fixed constant was negative 2. That was our bottom bound here. And so we could think about sketching a graph of g of t on the same axes, and that would look like this. And I'm just plotting here the values that we computed by finding areas. So g of negative 2 was 0, g of 0 was 5 halves, and so on. Now the second fundamental theorem of calculus says that if f is continuous on closed interval a, b, and g of x is defined to be the integral from a to x of f of t dt for x in the closed interval a, b, then g prime of x is equal to f of x for x in the open interval a, b. So what that's saying is that the derivative of this integral is just the function inside the integral. So we already knew that the integral of a derivative gave us the original function. Now what we have is that the derivative of an integral also gives us the original function. So for example, if g of x is defined to be the integral from 0 to x of 1 plus radical t dt, 
Here we're asked to find g prime of x by using the fundamental theorem. And so for that, we're just saying g prime of x is equal to f of x, which is one plus radical x. We take this x, plug it in for t, and we're done. That's what the second fundamental theorem tells us. We're also asked here to find g prime of x by first finding an antiderivative, capital F of t, and then by using the first fundamental theorem. So we can start here and actually take our antiderivative because for this function, we can easily find an antiderivative. So capital F of t would be t plus two-thirds t to the three-halves, right, because this is t to the one-half, so we add one to the power and divide by that number, so we're here. We plug in x, plug in zero, and subtract, and we get x plus two-thirds x to the three-halves. That's what g of x is equal to. So then what's g prime of x? Take the derivative here, and you get back one plus radical x. Same answer. But the thing is, for many functions, we won't be able to find an antiderivative. So being able to use the second fundamental theorem is very helpful. So here, use the fundamental theorem to find g prime of x. g of x is equal to the integral from one to x of two plus t to the fourth, all to the fifth power. So please pause the video and work on this. All we need to do here is take this x, plug it in for t, and we'll be done. So g prime of x is equal to two plus x to the fourth, all to the fifth power. Let's take a look at another. Use the fundamental theorem to find g prime of x. Now here we have g of x is the integral from one to sine x of two plus t to the fourth, all to the fifth. So now, instead of having just an x that we had here, now we have a function of x. And so what happens when we have a function of x here? We need to use the chain rule. This is a composition of functions. We can think of this as u equals sine x plugged into this function, say, h of u. And so our derivative is going to be h prime of u times u prime of x. And so that's two plus sine x to the fourth power, all to the fifth multiplied by the derivative of u, which is cosine x. So we're here. So essentially, we take the sine x, plug it in here, but then we have to also multiply by its derivative. That's what the chain rule says. So let's take a look at another. Use the fundamental theorem to find g prime of x, where g of x is equal to the integral from two to one over x of cosine squared t dt. Please pause the video and work on this. Again, we're gonna start by plugging this one over x in for t, and then we have to multiply by the derivative of one over x. So this gives us a negative x to the negative two, so this is negative one over x squared, cosine squared of one over x. And that's our g prime of x. Now note that from the definition of the definite integral, that's here, where delta x is equal to b minus a over n, we've always been talking about b being a greater number than a, so b minus a over n has always been a positive number. But what if we have the integral from b to a, where b is a greater number than a? Then our delta x would be a minus b over n, and that would be negative but everything else in the computation would remain the same. And so the integral from b to a of f of x dx is equal to negative of the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Again, if we reverse the order of the bounds, essentially what we're doing in our definition of the integral is just using a negative value for delta x, which just negates everything, and so the integral from b to a is negative of the integral from a to b. We can also see that in the evaluation using antiderivatives, this would be capital F of a minus capital F of b, and we're saying that is negative of capital F of b minus capital F of a. Now, let's use the fundamental theorem to find g prime of x here. Notice we have a constant on top and the function of x on the bottom. 
In order for us to use the fundamental theorem, we need the constant on the bottom of the integral. So the first thing we want to do is rewrite this integral as negative of the integral from 1 to sine x. Now we can use the fundamental theorem to find the derivative here by plugging the sine x in for t and then multiplying by the derivative of sine x. And so we're here. Now let's take a look at the average value of a function. We know how to take the average value of a finite set of numbers, that is for the set y1, y2, up to yn, we have that the average would be y1 plus y2 plus dot 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 plus yn, we'd add them all up and we'd divide by n. But what does it mean to take an average value of a function over an interval a, b? So we're talking about over a continuum here, there's infinitely many numbers here. So what would that even mean? Well, we can start by taking a finite number of function evaluations and taking their average, and we'll do this over equally spaced subintervals, like we usually do with delta x equaling b minus a over n. And so we're going to take a function evaluation in each subinterval and average those. So again, our ci is a point in the ith subinterval at which we take a function evaluation and let's take the average of those. Now notice that delta x is equal to b minus a over n, and so solving for n, we get n equals b minus a over delta x. And so then this average can be written as the sum of the function evaluations multiplied by delta x over b minus a. And so we can rewrite this as one over b minus a times a summation i going from 1 to n, f of c i, delta x. Now we recognize this summation. We know that if we take its limit, we're going to have our definite integral. Now notice the sum that we just set up is valid for any value of n, so we can let n go to infinity. And that would give us the average value of f over the entire interval. So that's the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over b minus a multiplied by the summation. And so that's 1 over b minus a times our definite integral from a to b of f of x. And so that gives us the average value of f over the interval a, b. And now using the mean value theorem, we can show that for a continuous function f on a, b, this average value is f of c for some c value in the open interval. So what we're saying is this average function value is actually a function evaluation at a particular point. There is a point for which this is the function evaluation, this average value. So if f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, then we know that g, defined this way, is also continuous on a, b. And we know g, defined to be this definite integral from a to x, of f of t is also continuous on a, b. And we know by the fundamental theorem that g of x is differentiable on the open interval. So by the mean value theorem, there exists a c in a, b such that g prime of c is equal to g of b minus g of a over b minus a. Now, what's g of b? g of b is this definite integral from a to b. G of a is a definite integral from a to a, which we know is zero because our delta x would be equal to zero. There would be no area there. G prime of c we know is equal to f of c, and so we're here. And so we can rewrite this as f of c is equal to one over b minus a times the interval from a to b of f of t. So this is saying that there exists a c in the open interval for which this average value of f is actually a function evaluation at x equals c. So let's take a look at an example. Find the average value of f of x equals x squared on the interval 0, 2. Also find the value of c in the open interval 0, 2 for which f of c is equal to the average value. So first let's find the average value that's going to be 1 over b minus a, so 1 over 2 minus 0, multiplied by the definite integral 0 to 2 of x squared. Take our antiderivative, plug in the bounds, and subtract, we get 4 thirds. So this is the average value of f over that interval. Now how do we find the c value for which f of c is equal to 4 thirds? 
we set f of c equal to 4 thirds. f of c is c squared, set that equal to 4 thirds, and so c must be radical 4 thirds. Notice that we only have a positive solution here because we're in the interval 0 to 2. Simplifying, we can write this as 2 over radical 3 for c. So what did we find? We found that 4 thirds is the average value of this function over the interval 0 to 2. That's the average function value, and it is achieved at x equals 2 over radical 3. Now notice what else this average value gives us. It's saying that the area of the rectangle, the area of the rectangle here given by the average value, that's equal to the area under the curve here. Because from the formula of the average value, if we multiply the average value multiplied by b minus a, that's the same as the definite integral. So multiplying 4 thirds by 2, this interval 2 minus 0 by 2, that gives us the same area as we have under the curve. Let's take a look at this one. Find the average value of y equals sine x on the interval 0 pi. So again, we're gonna start the same way, one over pi minus zero, multiplied by the integral of sine x from zero to pi. Taking an antiderivative here, we have negative cosine x, plugging in our bounds and subtracting, we're here. So we get two over pi as our average function value. And just to have an idea of what kind of number that is, I like to approximate, that's around two thirds, right? We know that pi is approximately three. So here's two over pi, that's our average function value over this interval for y equals sine x. Again, the area under the rectangle is gonna be the same as the area under the curve over this interval. Let's take a look at another. Find the average value of f of x equals x minus x squared over zero two. Again, we start the same way, one over two minus zero, multiplied by the integral from zero to two. We take our antiderivatives, plug in our bounds, and subtract, and so here we get negative one-third. But now let's take a look at this graph. This one's a little bit different, because our function here takes both values that are positive and negative over this interval from zero to two. So now the area of the rectangle that we get from the average function value is equal to the net area under the curve given by the integral. So we count this pink area with a positive and we count this pink area with a negative and adding that up together, that's what we get with the area of this rectangle. And with this, we'll conclude our lesson on the second fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of an integral.